Father, I thank you and praise you, honor you and bless you today. You know my need as I stand before you or sit before you, Lord, as the case may be. And Lord, here we are at a time when we want to consider the word. The word is life-giving. It's, it's, it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's living and powerful, and I just want it to go out living and powerful. So I pray, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would move in such a way that the anointing would be so strong that we would know the leading of the Lord as we consider the word right now. Our hearts are open to receive. Our ears are open to hear. And I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to talk to you about Psalm 100 secrets. Now, Psalm 100, not 100 secrets, okay? Psalm 100 secrets. Let's read Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Say this part with me. Know that the Lord, he is God. Say that with me again. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Read this next part with me. For the Lord is good. Let's say that again. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Amen. Psalm 100 is a short five verses. And yet there is so much contained here that we could unpack. Foundational truths are expressed. The pathway for approaching God is revealed here. And deep, deep encouragement for all believers is contained in these few short verses. I have highlighted two statements that you said with me that I believe are essential truths that must be expressed and embraced as foundational to our understanding of God in both the Old and New Testaments, specifically of the Psalms and the Gospels. We need to understand this morning, He is God and He is good. He is God and He is good. He is not one without the other. He is not all, he is not God always and good sometimes. He is not good always and yet something less than God. If there's any message at all that Satan wants to try to distort, pervert, or eliminate, it's this message. He is God and he is good. If Satan can alter that truth in any measure, he can change what we believe about God, what we believe about his word, about his promises, about our relationship with Christ, and about our eternal future. If he can make us believe something other than he is God and he is good. To the degree that we believe or, the, or to the degree that we doubt that he is God and that he is good is the same degree that we will live in or out of sync with the heart of God. If Satan can get you to doubt either part of this, that he's God and that he's good, he's done all he needs to do to ultimately derail your journey of faith. It doesn't take a major calamity. All it takes is a little doubt. A little question in your mind. Well, if he was God, then maybe this wouldn't have happened. Or if he was good, then why does he allow? All it takes is a little doubt. It just takes the seed. Now, we need to consider both of these, beginning with he is God. Verse 3 again said, know that the Lord, he is God. That's worth saying together again. Know that the Lord, He is God. The Lord, 
Literally, that's it, that, that comes from his personal name, the Lord, Jehovah, or in the original Hebrew, Yehovah. The self-existing one is God, Elohim, the supreme one. Moses reminded all of Israel of this truth in Deuteronomy 4 and 35. To you it was shown that, it might, that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. He's not one of many. He's not even the greatest of many. One of the ways Satan has deluded this truth is by creating in the hearts and minds of men other gods, other deities, other religions, other philosophies for the world to embrace. It's estimated that there are currently over 4,000 distinct religions in the world. And 85% of the world's population identify with some religious group. You think the world's not mixed up? 4,000 different religions. Some of these religions are exclusive to the one God of that religion. Other religions are more accommodating to the idea of compatibility of beliefs. One of the tools the enemy uses against Christianity is its exclusiveness to Jehovah as God and Jesus Christ, his son, as the only means of salvation. That's one of the tools the enemy uses against the mind that doesn't believe that he is God and that he is good. Because the world prefers an inclusive message. Inclusive without pressure or preference to any one God, or any one approach to worshiping that God. But the Bible says, the Bible makes very clear, there is no God beside Him. Amen. Jehovah Elohim, the Lord, He is God. And if we are truly followers of Jesus Christ, we are going to be exclusive when it comes to our belief in God. We will believe, as Psalm 100 declares, the Lord is God. Interestingly enough, it's not just the church against the world. It's also the church against the church. There may not be a single organization on earth more divided in what it believes than the church. Grace versus holiness. Saturday versus Sunday. Jesus versus the Holy Spirit. Hymnals versus overhead projectors. Trinitarians versus Jesus only. Miracles and healing versus cessationism. Wow, what do we actually believe? A lot of division, even over one God. Ephesians 4 verses 4 through 6 says it this way, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Here is why it is so vital to be settled on Him being God and God alone. If he's not God, can he actually save us? If he's not God, can he actually heal us? If he's not God, does he have any right to expect change in us? If he's not God, is there actually an eternity awaiting us in heaven? If he's not God, of what value is your faith? If he's not God, he cannot just be an idea or a philosophy and still have all these other pieces remain true. He alone must be God, the self existent one, the one who at the beginning said, Let there be, and there was, who with the sound of his own voice created all that has been created. 
He alone must be God. If we're going to believe we can be saved, He must be God. If we're going to believe we can be healed, he must be God. He must be who the Bible tells us he is. He is God and there is no other. You know what the interesting thing is? The very thing the devil is trying to distort, the very thing he's trying to divert us away from, the very thing he's trying to dilute and make us not believe is exactly what he believes himself. He believes Jehovah is God. James 2 and 19 says, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. The very message the enemy wants you to throw out is the very message they know to be true. That there is one God, one God who saves us, one God who calls us his own, one God. Believing that he is God is a huge part of this thought. We must embrace, we we must not see him as one of many paths, one of many truths. He is the truth. Jesus declared that his word is truth. Believing that he is God is a huge part of this thought, but it's not the only part because we've got to believe that he is God and that he is good. Verse 5 of Psalm 100 says, for the Lord is good. You want to say that with me again? For the Lord is good. Which means he's of favorable character. He's desirable, bountiful, profitable, advantageous, agreeable, pleasant, wholesome, commendable, kind, and benevolent. For the Lord is good. Psalm 34 and 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. You know, it isn't how it is, but what if it is? What if it was? He could be God and also be a tyrant. He could be God Almighty, the self-existent one, and care nothing for anything except himself. He could have been. But that's not his character. He's good. Being God is his nature, his being. He is self-existing without beginning and end. He is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-present. He is God, but his character, his character. Bump your neighbor and say his character is good. He's above reproach. He intends only the best, always. He is motivated by love and compassion. He is God and he is good. If we don't believe he is good, then we have to believe his love is conditional. Right? If you don't believe he's good, if you don't believe he's good, you have to believe his love is conditional. He will love me if I meet all his demands. He will love me if I toe the line. He will love me if I dot my I's and cross my T's. He will love me, and only then do I have a chance to be loved. If he's not good, then his motives are to punish and restrict, not to save and deliver. Are you catching what I'm saying? If we don't believe he is good, then evil has no comparison and thus cannot be addressed. If God were evil in any portion of his character, he couldn't call us out on ours. If we don't believe he is good, then we cannot believe God does anything with our best interests in mind. If he is just God without also being good, then he can only be seen as an unbending, legalistic rule giver with no patience, tolerance, or grace for our human condition. If we don't believe, he's good.
But if he is also good, if he's God and he is also good, then he is the most desirable object of our affection ever. If he is good, then everything he says, asks, demands, and does is the evidence of his good intentions toward us. Religion is the image of a God who is not good. Relationship is the invitation of a God who is good. What is the motivation for anyone who isn't good in their character? You've known a few of those people in your life, people who weren't of good character. What was their motivation? Self-gratitude, self-gratification, selfishness, whatever pleased them. And yet God alone has expressed the most selfless act ever by offering his only son to become a curse and a ransom for us. Jesus himself confirms the goodness of God. Luke 18, verses 18 and 19, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God, but one, that is God. I think Jesus was doing two things right here. Two things. He was pointing out that there's one God, his Father, and that the, his Father is good but he was also pointing out saying, you see my father in me, don't you? If we don't believe God is good, we will always settle for a lesser narrative about ourselves. Everything that happens to us in our lives, if it's not in the context that God is good and that he's good all the time, what we believe about our lives, what we believe about ourselves will always be a lesser narrative than the one God has actually wrote out about you. If we don't believe God is good, what does that do to the whole identity in Christ thought? That's been a big thing around here for some years. Several years ago, I spent a whole year telling you, you are who God says you are. But if God isn't good, would you care what God said about you? How would it impact your belief about yourself? If God isn't good, then can I actually believe I'm a child of God? Can I really believe I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ? If God isn't good, are the promises really yes and amen? At best, they can only be hit and miss, conditional. And if God isn't good, can I take the word of God at face value? Are you seeing why these two truths together are so foundational? They impact the entire narrative of salvation, relationship, and identity. That he is God and he is good. If he is God without also being good, then everything we read in his word is suspect and is also subject to whatever frame of mind he may be in at any given moment. But if he is good, and let me say this again, if he is good but he is not God, then he has no power to accomplish the good intentions he communicates. You've met people that wanted to do good in your life but were powerless to do so. He's got to be both God and good. He's got to have the power to do it and the good character to want to do it. If he is God and not good, he delights in our struggles. If he is good but not God, then as much as he wants to deliver us from our struggles, he cannot. But if he is God and good, he has the will and the power to rescue us from our struggles. You still with me? The Lord, he is God and he is good. Psalm 100 says he created us and not we ourselves. And he didn't create us to take out his anger on us. He created us to live in fellowship and intimacy with himself. 
And even after we messed it all up, this good God set in motion a predetermined plan to win us back. What if he was God and not good and we blew it? Where would we be? Well, you all didn't stick with the plan, so you're out. But because he was good, he revealed to us Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We cannot allow the enemy, we cannot allow the circumstances of life to skew our view of God. Don't be robbed in your believing. Take a fresh look. The Lord, he is God, and the Lord is good. That should make you confident about who you are to him. The circumstances of your life are liars. They are not the indicators of whether he is God or he is good. My struggles are not from God, but they are an opportunity for the goodness of God. If he isn't God and if he isn't good, then it couldn't be goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. And yet the word of God declares, surely, without a doubt... Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life because the Lord, he is God, and the Lord, he is good. We say it all the time, and I did it on purpose earlier, earlier in the service. God is good, and all the time. But church, it's more than a cute and catchy church cliche. It's the truth. It's foundational truth. Before anything else can fall into place when it comes to kingdom living and kingdom values and power and position and identity, we must have this settled. The Lord, He is God, and the Lord is good. If we're convinced of that, it'll change the way we face everything. It'll be solid, stable ground for us instead of shifting ground and we're always wondering how I'm going to get a footing in this life. The Lord, He is God. And the Lord is good. We need to be convinced of that. Hey, spend some time with Psalm 100 this week. See what you can pull out of it as you read. Five verses. Five verses. Spend some time meditating it because I'm coming back with it again next week. Psalm 100. There's a lot to unpack here. The Lord, he is God. That's all right. Both answers are right. But in order, he is and the Lord is good. Stand with me this morning.